afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us on this uh, second installment of our summer seminar series presented by the University of Iowa Libraries Department of Special Collections. Thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, we're, we're delighted to have you on board. My name is David McCartney. I'm the university archivist here at the University of Iowa Libraries. And as I mentioned, this is the second installment of our summer series. And today I'll be talking a bit about my corner of the world, the university archives. We have a number of uh, things to share with you in the next few minutes. And also I'll tell you a bit about our services that uh, uh, we can provide for you both uh, online and Eventually, again, we hope uh, in person after the uh, uh, pandemic passes. So with that, I'm going to go to the uh, screen and I will uh, bring up my talk here in just a minute. And as you can tell from the title, University of Iowa Archives, Preserving and Telling Our Stories, this pretty much sums up what we do in our department. We are a collector of records, we preserve records, and we also share those records with our research public. That's where the telling comes in. And for the next few minutes, I'll tell you a bit of uh, university history trivia, a bit of uh, information about our holdings, and again, uh, some information about our department services. This is one of my favorite early images of our central campus. We call it today the Pentacrest. And this image comes from our, uh, I think about 1875, one of our uh, late 19th century course catalogs published by the university. The middle building, of course, uh, your I'm sure many of you are familiar with, if you're from the University of Iowa, of course you recognize it as the old capital the uh, original state capital and prior to uh, 1846 for several years it was our territorial capital in Iowa City flanked by a couple of buildings that are no longer in existence uh, but it's historically accurate except for one thing and you might notice at the very bottom of the image if you can uh, make out the wording it reads Iowa State University now, my, uh, my friends and colleagues at Ames may take exception to this, but I have to <laughs> explain a little bit about how that came into being. In, um, uh, in, in the uh, mid-19th century, when the university at Iowa City was uh, indeed chartered by the Iowa legislature, we were, from the very beginning, known as the State University of Iowa, and that, in fact, today is our official name. But as time passed, the uh, powers that be at the university, the uh, publishers of the catalog and others associated with the State University of Iowa took some liberties with that name because our other two sister region institutions at Ames and Cedar Falls did not at the time include the word university in their name. So for shorthand, we became known for a time informally as Iowa State University. Now, uh, to this day, people still confuse us with our sister institution, Iowa State University at Ames. But this all came about uh, through some confusion that was uh, ramped up by about 1959. By that time, Iowa State College at Ames indeed officially renamed itself Iowa State University of Science and Technology. And our uh, other sister institution, the uh, uh, what was known as the Iowa State Teachers College at Cedar Falls, uh, eventually renamed itself the University of Northern Iowa. And by 1959, there was a great deal of confusion among the three institutions as to who was named and how. And the uh, Board of Regents in 1964 recognized this. They responded to a request from University of Iowa President Howard Bowen to shorten our name informally to the University of Iowa, dropping the word state. Although officially we are, as I keep reminding my friends at, at, uh, at Ames, that uh, we are the State University of Iowa for legal and other formal purposes. But uh, for a time, we were indeed nicknamed Iowa State, and uh, that uh, comes up from time to time in our records. 
This is one of my favorite images of the old Capitol. This is from the uh, west looking eastward down Iowa Avenue. And this image appears in the 1947 Hawkeye yearbook, one of the first volumes to feature color photo illustrations. Those of you who have been in Iowa City for a few years may recall back in November of 2001, the uh, uh, capital, old capital was undergoing some restoration work at that time. And when construction proceeded in the uh, attic area of the dome, uh, a propane uh, 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 flame application tool was accidentally tipped over. It caused a fire in the old Capitol Dome and it was uh, a very, uh, very devastating scene. It was fortunate that the fire did not spread into other portions of the old capital. However, the original dome and cupola were lost and it was clear that some uh, detailed architectural drawings would be needed in order to replicate the dome in its replacement form. What we did at the university archives was provide digital scans of building plans that we have in our holdings and we provided them online to the architectural firm based in Boston which was tasked with creating new plans for the capital old capital dome replacement and so we played a role as a partner in the restoration of the old capital dome by providing the architectural firm with these drawings by a the internet. It was one of our first attempts to share information digitally uh, and it, it, it turned out to be a very fruitful uh, relationship. I told you a bit uh, about our department yesterday. I'll uh, just uh, recap briefly if I may. The Department of Special Collections is located on the third floor of the main library. This is our entrance and when you come in you'll be greeted with a sign. It has a few rules. Uh, if you should visit our reading room after the pandemic passes and we hope at some point after August 17th, we will be able to at least have limited access to materials on site again, although that is not firm yet. There will be some uh, additional uh, rules in place at that time. But in general, we ask our patrons who visit to abide by rules in order to help us better preserve material. We're as Many of you may already know we are a non-circulating part of the library. We don't charge out materials. However, we do have a way for you to access materials either on site or online. And we also have provisions in the reading room for uh, scanning. If the materials lend themselves to that, you can certainly scan whatever uh, material is uh, uh, at your disposal. Our staff will be eager to help you. We'll get you set up. We'll grant you a research registration uh, for uh, 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 using material. You'll be assigned a seat in our reading room and uh, we'll be happy to help with questions during your visit. So the University Archives really is the uh, institutional memory of the university. We have official records from central administration, but we also have a lot of material pertaining to student life, the uh, not so official records. And one of my favorites is the Code for Co-Eds. Now this was a publication of Associated Women Students uh, in Courier Hall, that uh, a project that began in uh, about 1936. And for about 30, 33 years, the Code for Coeds was published as an annual uh, welcome to the campus publication for incoming freshman women students. And Throughout the time of its publication, it served as a, a fashion guide. It had uh, information about curfew rules, uh, all sorts of information for uh, incoming uh, freshman women students. And it's a, in its own way, it's a fascinating barometer of social mores. When you look through uh, successive issues of the code, you can actually 
see firsthand how rules have changed over a period of time. And by, by about 1970, the code had uh, run its course. And like many traditions on campus during that time, it had ceased publication. But we do have a complete set in the archives. And it's, uh, it, it, it's a very useful tool in terms of gaining sort of, uh, the nature of student life at a particular time. Student life collections include materials pertaining to other traditions, special events. Uh, this is from our homecoming records collection. This is a flyer from 1965. And we also have records of various uh, of the various cultural centers on campus, beginning with the 1968 opening of the Afro American Cultural Center and House. The uh, Afro House, as it is called uh, informally, is uh, the uh, charter uh, center on campus. It uh, was the first of several to open, beginning in 1968, following a report that was issued by uh, then. Dean of Students, Philip Hubbard, that uh, there was a, clearly a, a demonstrated need for African-American students at a predominantly white institution to have a, a space for mutual support and for community gathering. And so with that, the Afro-American Cultural Center opened uh, in subsequent years, the Latino Native American Cultural Center in 1972 opened, the uh, Asian Pacific Island American uh, Center opened uh, a number of years later, uh, as uh, is the uh, LGBT Community Center. This is one of my favorite images of um, social life in early 20th century at the University of Iowa. This comes from the Petrobus Cassius Robinson papers, uh, an African-American student who obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry in uh, 1927. And Mr. Robinson had a camera. He took photographs all over campus and in the Iowa City area. Uh, and we were fortunate to receive a, a scrapbook and photograph album uh, several years ago, which we prioritized for digitizing. And today you can find these uh, images in the Iowa Digital Library, and they are indeed listed as a collection under the name Petrobus Cassius Robinson. We have hundreds of postcards dating from about 1910 forward depicting campus scenes. This is a view of the Iowa Memorial Union not too long after it opened, uh, about 1926. From here, we're looking southwest at the IMU from the corner of, um, let's see, North Madison Street and Market. And uh, we don't have a date for this, but judging from the automobiles parked uh, in front, uh, we're going to put it at uh, around 1926 or soon, uh, soon thereafter. The University of Iowa was the first university in the nation to recognize creative work as a means of recognizing the control of uh, of advanced degrees, both at the master's and doctoral level, beginning in 1925 at the behest of the uh, Dean of the Graduate College at the time, Carl Seashore. And a few years later, the MFA, the Master of Fine Arts degree was uh, uh, awarded beginning in uh, uh, 1940. This image is from our Department of Theater Arts Photographs Collection. Um, appears to be a radio drama and probably was a production early on uh, in the 1930s on WSUI, our NPR member station, which at the time carried many student-oriented uh, productions. You recognize this individual. The uh, gentleman on the left is one Jerome Silberman from Milwaukee, also and perhaps better known as Gene Wilder. He, is, uh, he was a uh, 1954 alumnus of the uh, theater program here uh, at the University of Iowa and uh, his papers are in our manuscript collections uh, here at the uh, Department of Special Collections. 
We have documentation that uh, contemporaneously covered events. This is an undated photo, but probably from about 1970, uh, taken downtown. We're looking southeast across Clinton Street uh, at the corner of College. That bank building in the background is still there today. Uh, these are either uh, Iowa State Highway Patrol officers or Iowa City Police. There was, at that time, uh, believed to be in 1970, there was considerable tension between the uh, university administration headed by President uh, Sandy Boyd and the Iowa State Highway Patrol over whether to permit the presence of highway patrol officers on campus. And the Boyd administration was very strongly opposed to that, thinking that that uh, would only uh, aggravate uh, uh, tensions on campus. And uh, the uh, contemporary comment I'll make in, at this point is uh, what uh, is old is uh, new again, uh, or to perhaps quote David Byrne from Talking Heads, same as it ever was. Uh, this is a, a scene that very well could be uh, a witness today. African-American students were not permitted to live in university housing until 1946. And uh, indeed, there was a need for uh, housing for African-American students who were uh, admitted to the university, but in terms of uh, residential services and uh, other services, there was uh, uh, continued segregation until after World War II. And uh, five of these six women were uh, among those who uh, were the, the uh, African-American women students who had uh, integrated Courier Hall, which up to that point had housed only uh, white uh, women students. The uh, sixth woman in this uh, image is uh, a friend of the group. The papers of uh, Esther Walls and also of uh, Virginia Harper, uh, two of the women who integrated Courier Hall, are located in the Iowa Women's Archives. Uh, which is also located in the main library, and you'll have an opportunity to hear, to, to hear about the Iowa Women's Archives uh, in our series later this summer. In this time of the pandemic, we are curtailing our in-person services, unfortunately, but we do have a number of resources online. For example, the Daily Iowan, our campus newspaper, going back to 1868 when it was originally known as The Vedette, and we have these available online. You can see the address there. It's dailyiowan.lib.uiowa.edu. Or if you just do a Google search for uh, Daily Iowan Archives, it'll be the first hit when you bring it up. Our yearbooks are online too, and we have a century's worth in our holdings. They cover 1892 up until the last year of publication, 1992. And again, if you Google the term Hawkeye yearbooks, it will be the first hit that you'll get in your uh, Google search if you're interested in browsing through uh, a, a back issue of uh, one of our campus here. About three years ago, we launched a website devoted to the 1960s decade in Iowa City. And this is our home page. If you uh, pay a visit to it, you'll see a lot of content. Uh, you'll scroll down on the front page and find a number of links to uh, motion picture films and some audio recordings from that period that we have digitally reformatted. If you Google Iowa City 60s and you spell out the word 60s, S-I-X-T-I-E-S, it'll be the first hit that comes up in your Google search. It's a lot of fun and if you're uh, of, of a certain age, um, as I am, uh, we had a lot of fun putting it together and uh, it really uh, was, was very instructive for us and uh, hope it's something you can enjoy too. As I said earlier, we are temporarily closed to the public due to the pandemic, but we are undergoing a phased reopening process um, beginning on about August 17th. 
we may have uh, limited access available in the reading room, perhaps by appointment, but Margaret can help uh, correct me on that if I, uh, if I don't have that information uh, uh, correct. The other uh, point to remember is we do indeed have many resources available online. If you visit our department website, uh, for uh, the University of Iowa Libraries Special Collections. You can get an overview. And again, specifically, if you Google University of Iowa Archives, you'll end up on our landing page. And with that, I will be happy to open up for questions. I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us.